Well, good morning, church. Uh, so repeat after me. God can do more than we ask or imagine. One more time. God can do more than we ask or imagine. So last fall we talked a lot about an, a capital campaign and we're excited that today is the day of the official launch of the campaign. So for those of you that thought we were going to be playing Pictionary uh, during church today, I'm sorry you are mistaken. These symbols represent some of the dreams um, about this campaign that I'll talk about in just, just a few moments. I, I want to say thank you, first of all, uh, if, you, if you paid attention to the bulletin last fall, we were further behind in our normal contribution than we had been in many years Uh, But last week, uh, because of the year-end giving, uh, we nearly made up all the deficit last week. So thank you for your uh, generosity um, as a church family. What we want to do today is really, the the teaching part of the the, the day is in two parts. In a few moments, Howard Norton is back with us. We're really excited about that. He's been helping us behind the scenes quite a bit, and he's he's taught class several times and preached um, last fall, and so we're happy to have him back. He'll be preaching out of 1 Thessalonians 4 in just a few minutes. What I want to do, uh, hopefully very briefly here, is be transparent about the nature of this debt, the dreams that we have and and hope to accomplish when money is freed up, and then be really clear with you about what you can do to help us in this campaign. So we're calling the the campaign Imagine, based on the verse we just read together. So here's here's a little bit about our debt. We're four and a half million dollars in debt, Half million of that money is from land that we just purchased a few months ago in North Edmond for our Heritage Church of Christ church plant. The other uh, two notes on that plant, each about two million, uh, two million each. One is for uh, the summit, which we built several years ago, and the other is for uh, renovations to our kids' wing, which were done just a few years back. So you put all that together, and that's four and a half million dollars. Now, for a, for a church our size with all our assets. Four and a half million is actually not that much to be in debt, but we've been asking the question, what could we do with money that was freed up if we weren't in debt at all? So here's some of the goals uh, for you, which will show you how much money we we would have per year. So if we were to raise a a million and a half, that would free up $125,000 a year for more ministry. Or if we freed up 2.5 million, we'd have 215 million a year. Or if we were able... Uh, by the grace of God, to eliminate all the debt at four and a half million, we would have an extra half million dollars a year to do ministry. And again, if you get lost in the numbers, very simply, the less debt that we have, the more ministry that we can do. And so what I want to do now is I want to tell you a few of the things that we've thought about and, and dreams that we have about what we could do with the money that's freed up. Some of these dreams have come from you all as members, some have come from elders, some have come from staff members, we've collected these ideas over the last three years, and I'm going to present them in two categories. One is going to be growing pains. There are certain things that we've just outgrown the model because of our size. And then, and then the other category will be kingdom dreams. So uh, we'll begin over here. We have outgrown our model uh, for community care and benevolence. So each year we have 300 people walk in off the streets or call asking for for money or services from our church. And then we have 120 people from our own membership that need uh, either benevolence help or counseling services. That's a lot of people. You can throw those stats up there on the screen. That's a lot of people that need help. We've got one full-time counselor and then a part-time worker to handle these needs. And so we've really outgrown our model there. And so this is one thing we, that we might want to do if, if money was freed up. I'll come over here now. We've also outgrown our model for senior care ministry. We've got 421 people over the age of 65 at Memorial Road. That's a lot of people. And it's, it's one of our only age groups where we don't have any dedicated staff hours to give attention to these people, both from a care standpoint and also an empowering uh, standpoint. You know, think about our culture. Our culture has said no to racism, uh, but our culture has yet to say no to ageism. Uh, it, it's very much part of our, our culture. Uh, the, the aged are judged uh, in, in the culture that we live in. I was reading the Old Testament the other day. You know the verse, love your neighbor as yourself, comes from Leviticus chapter 19? Here's the verse just before that, if you'll throw this up there on the screen. 
Stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. We don't have any ministry like that. And one way to enact the justice of God would be, would be to use some of the money uh, to have a ministry like that. We have 800 people in Q groups. We have Q group uh, staffing. We don't have a, a small groups minister. There are very few churches in this country our size which had a min without a minister for small groups. And if you think about the big picture, what small groups are is they're one of the best ways to fight against the back door. We've got a big front door at Memorial Road, people coming to our church. We've got a big back door, people slipping through the cracks. And one of the best ways to not fall through the cracks is through small groups. So this is one thing that we might do uh, with freed up money. Another thing we'd love to relaunch, uh, kind of a growing pain, we out we've outgrown our training model. In the past, we used to train up ministers with something we called a two-year residency program. And, and we sent them and without, without a minister. minister. Here's some of the people that came into this program, many of which are still in ministry throughout the country. A few years ago, we had to cut this program for budgeting reasons, and we'd love uh, to bring this, this program back. Another growing pain that we have is, is where our missionaries are funded through. When, when Mission Sunday started years ago, it was really for special one-time gifts. You know, someone needs a bus in Africa or, or a building in Brazil. Well, what's happened is we've actually put some ongoing salary support for our missionaries in the special missions contribution, and that was never its intent. And so one of the things that we'd like to do if we have this money freed up is to move some of those salaries from the Mission Sunday uh, to normal contribution so that our Mission Sunday contribution in the summer can really be what it was set out uh, to be at the beginning. And then I'll come to this one, this little yellow triangle here. Our physical plant, it, it needs some improvements. Our journey, Journeyland Wing is our oldest part of our building. It's, it's desperately need, in need of, of some improvements. Uh, even this room, 21 years old, still a really great room, but there's some updates that we need to make. Uh, I'll talk about technology for a second. For a church our size, we are way behind uh, the technology curve. And it's not that the people that are working on those things don't do a great job. We don't have any uh, staff hours dedicated to that. Uh, and so talk about the front door. Uh, one of the great ways to reach outsiders is through your media presence, uh, up, updating li live stream, things like that. So there's a lot of things that we, we need to do to update our, our physical plan. So I would say all these, again, I would say these are just growing pains. We've outgrown our, our, our size, or we've outgrown the model because of our size in a lot of these areas. Now, I'll mention a few that I, I would call cute that I just a few months ago. Uh, and, and here shortly, we're going to launch the Heritage Church of Christ. Well, we want those churches to succeed. And wouldn't it be cool if in 10 years, if both those churches had 500,000, 1,500 people, you can throw this next slide up, slide up here. What could we do now to really set those churches up to succeed? We don't know exactly what that would look like, but we don't have any money set aside for that right now. So that's, this is one thing that we might do with, uh, with money that, that's freed up from this campaign. Another thing that we're thinking about is, is rural churches in Oklahoma. I've talked about this before, but in the last decade, 24 rural churches of Christ have closed their doors. And we're wondering, what is our role in helping some of these struggling churches? A few of our members, like Aaron Seacrest and others, have done some grassroots ministry for these, for these churches or these, these congregations, but we're wondering what, what could we do if we had more uh, dedicated funds uh, towards church, uh, rural church support. Another, one of our other kingdom dreams would be, what if we set aside money for a fund called MRCC Cares? And what if this fund was specifically for responding to the needs of the community really quickly? So, so for example, let, let's say there's a, there's a hurricane and a thousand refugees have to come our way. Well, wouldn't it be cool if we already had money aside, set aside, and we could say, hey, we'd love to take care of you because we care. In a similar way, we'd love to, this star right here represents, we'd love to have some money set aside specifically for dreaming. Some of the greatest ministries that have ever happened in this congregation have come because people had big dreams. And wouldn't it be cool if we had a certain fund set aside specifically for innovation and experimenting and, and creative ideas. We, we love to do that. Uh, another one that, another big kingdom dream at this church is this uh, symbol here with these people. Part of our DNA at Memorial Road, especially in the last few years, we're becoming 
uh, very good at taking care of children. In fact, in our, in, our, in our church family, we have 59 families that either have adopted kids or foster kids. Well, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of families. It, it's just becoming part of our culture. Now, the state still has a lot of needs uh, when it comes to fostering and adoption. There's 9,000 kids in our state somewhere in the foster care system, and those families need a lot of support. And there's a lot more kids that, that need foster parents that don't have them. In fact, every single year, 300 kids age out of foster care. And this is one of those things that this is really part of our culture here. And so we're wondering if we had a little bit of money set aside, what level could we take this ministry to um, with some of, some of that money? And then the last kingdom dream I'll share with you is, what if we had a halfway house? The most fruitful ministry at Memorial Road Church of Christ in terms of baptisms is our prison ministry. In the last 10 years, the prison ministry has baptized 2,014 people. Isn't that incredible? 2,014 people. That's like a second Memorial Road. And what happens is we give these people freedom in Christ, but then many of them get, get out of prison and they don't, they don't have any place to go. They don't have training to get them jobs. And so wouldn't it be cool if we could disciple some of these people through a halfway house and really build that, that branch um, and, and make it a growth stream for both our congregation and the kingdom of God. So there's, there's 12 ideas for you. And, and to be honest, we don't know which ones uh, that we will do because we don't, know, we don't know what kind of money is going to be freed up. But we really believe that God can do pretty incredible things if we did have some of that money freed up. So let me talk about your, your move here. What, what can you do to contribute to this? The main thing you need to know today is that in the lobby, if you're a member, you're going to get a packet. It's a really well done packet. I've just kind of scratched the surface. The packet you're going to get uh, goes into details about all, all of these ministries. We want every member to pick up a packet. They're listed in alphabetical order. There's, there's big tables out in the foyer. So on your way to Bible class or after Bible class, you might pick up your packet. For those of you who do not pick up your packets, we're going to mail those to your house. We're just trying to save uh, money on, on costs. So uh, pick up your packet today if you can, and then I'll give you a lot of the details. At the end of your packet, you'll find a pledge card. And here's what we're asking. Take one month and pray about what God's putting on your heart to give to this campaign. And at the beginning of February, we'll ask that you turn these pledge cards in. One of the questions we've got uh, fairly often so far is, well, Phil, how do I know how much I should give? Can you give me some kind of a ballpark figure? Well, here, here's one way to think about that. The, the three-year Imagine campaign, you can, hit, you can hit this next one. The three-year debt campaign is about the same amount of money as one year of normal budget. They're both just shy of $5 million. And so one way to think about it is, if I could give the amount of money I give in one year normally over three years to the special debt campaign, if we all did that, we would actually eliminate all four and a half million dollars of debt. Now, we hope and pray that many of you will give even beyond that, but that's one way to think about it if you're trying to figure out uh, how much to give. A few more, oh, and let me, let me a few more uh, comments and then I'll uh, uh, I'll be done here. Uh, one comment is this. Some of you might be in a, in a place where you're thinking, man, I'd love to give to this, but I, I'm just not in the season of life where I can do that. That's fine. We really anticipate that many of you will join this campaign in year two or year three, and, and that's okay if you're in a season where you, where you can't give as much right now. In fact, great news. We, just this past week, we started Financial Peace. 160 people uh, enrolled in that program. By far, the biggest group we've ever had uh, sign up for a financial peace class. So we really anticipate that in the future, um, if you can't give now, you will be able to, and we're excited about that. Uh, a few things to tell you. One, as leaders, we're, we're trying to be good stewards of the money that you give us. So first of all, we're keeping the budget flat next year as much as we can. Uh, second of all, the ministers have declined cost of living increases for this coming year because we really believe in the power of this debt elimination campaign. And then third, we're going to reduce the special missions contribution this summer uh, because we don't want to uh, put before you two really, really big financial goals the same year. And so that will be reduced likely in, in the next several years to accommodate all this. And then lastly, I, I'm really excited to share this with you. So we've had, we've already got pledges from a few groups of people. Uh, I'm going to uh, name four of them we've already got pledges from. The ministers, the elders, 
the deacons and some pace setters uh, in this congregation. And together, those four groups have pledged $1.7 million uh, to this campaign. Now, $1.5 million is the celebration goal, and so we have already surpassed the celebration goal. And so, let's give all the glory to God in celebration for that. I want, I want you to hear from a few of our members who talk about some of these dreams, uh, so watch this brief video. It is a great joy uh, for Jane and me to be here with you. Uh, when we come back to Memorial Road, we feel like we are coming home. Some of the very happiest days of our lives uh, are those days when we were associated with this congregation. In fact, it was 47 years ago today uh, that we first worshiped with this congregation. The first time that I ever met this congregation was 47 years ago on the first Sunday of the new year. So the date might be a little bit different, but 47 years is a long time ago. And when people tell me that I haven't changed a bit in those 47 years, I think about how bad I must have looked back then. <laughs> but it is really good to be here. Not only do we get to see some wonderful friends that we've known through the years, uh, but we get to be with family members. We've got uh, Ted and Bev, of course, living here in the area, and Will and Lacey and Kate. And then we have another grandson and his wife and another great-grandbaby and another great-grandbaby on the way this week. So this is really a special place, and we're glad to be with you. This is a, a very special time of year, and uh, it's a family time of year. And we've had a wonderful holiday season. I hope you have too. I didn't think that the OU game was turned out quite the way I wanted it to. But you know, one of the great things about this time of year is magnificent sports and a lot of good eating. And we enjoyed all of that. One thing I like about this time of the year is to be able to look back and see uh, what was accomplished during the year that just ended and uh, I like to think about the future. There were two sports stories that really stood out in my mind at the end of, of uh, this particular holiday season. One thing that I read about was the fact that Jose Altuve, the five foot, six inch, 165 pound second baseman for the Houston Astros, winners of the World Series this year, a man that's very much, very much too short, at least he was always told that, to make it in the big leagues, was chosen as the most valuable player of the American League this year. He had a 346 batting average and he has won the American League batting average uh, or batting championship three different times. He is Sports Illustrated's Sports Person of the Year. And I like the fact that he is reported to be a practicing believer. Another man that I read about in sports this year, watched him play on television, was Shaquem Griffin. Shaquem Griffin was a linebacker for the University of Central Florida. He is an outstanding linebacker, was chosen as the defensive MVP in the Peach Bowl this year. What makes him so remarkable is he only has one hand. When he was four years old, 
because of a disease, his left hand had to be amputated. And it was absolutely amazing to watch him in the Peach Bowl playing linebacker and only having one hand. In 2016, he was the American Athletic Conference Defensive Player of the Year. He was a second-team All-American in 2017. And his goal is to play in the NFL. And you know, I believe he's going to make it. He is determined to make it with one hand. Now, when you look at Al Tuvey, who by all reasonable assumptions would be uh, too small to be a major league baseball player and certainly to accomplish the things that he accomplished. And you look at Shaquem Griffin and you see what he has accomplished in spite of the fact that since he was four years old, he hasn't had a left hand. And you look at those men and you think to yourself, what makes them tick? What is it that people like that have in common? Well, that is a good question. And interestingly, Altuve recently said after winning the World Series, this is his comment. Winning the World Series, winning the MVP, you feel like you have everything. But my perspective is to try and get better every year. And if we win World, one World Series, why not win another one? Now, Griffin made a similar comment concerning himself. He said, my whole goal is to be better than what I was last year and be a better me. Everything I learned, everything I accomplished, the best is yet to be. These two men at the very top of their games as they look back over what they've accomplished, instead of being satisfied or saying, I want to get better. I want to improve. I want to accomplish more and more in my field. As I look back over the 47 years that I've known this congregation, that has always been the spirit of this church. From the very first day we came here, the first Sunday of 1971, this congregation has had an indomitable desire to get better and to accomplish more. And I think the reason for that is a strong commitment to Jesus Christ, a commitment to excellence in the kingdom of God. And I think also there has always been an awareness here that there is something very dangerous about success. And the thing that's dangerous about success is that we reach that success and we decide that we have done enough. A very interesting comment that I found in a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great said this, good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the reasons why we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools principally because we have good schools. 
We don't have great government principally because we have good governments. Few people attain great lives in large part because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. We settle too quickly for what is good. I found this church good when I got here in 1971. But I found this church wanting to do better. And I believe that that is still the goal of the Memorial Road congregation. If you will open your Bibles in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, there's a marvelous passage there about the Thessalonian church. It was a church that started in the midst of persecution. It was a church which very quickly began to imitate the men who had carried the gospel to them. It was a church made up of idolaters who turned their back on idolatry in order to find, in order to serve the Lord. It was a church that was waiting faithfully for the second coming of Jesus. It was a great church. We talk a lot about the Philippian church. That was a great church. Avon Malone used to call it the Lord's Sweetheart Church. And it is difficult to imagine a better congregation than Philippi. But I want to tell you, the church in Thessalonica was a great church. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul, talking to them, says, Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And in verse 10, he says, For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to love each other more and more. That phrase, more and more, has been a characteristic of this church. This church has always been a good church. We certainly have the precedent in the church in Thessalonica that we need to do more and more. And we have the inspiration of the history of this church here in 2018 to do more than we have ever done before. I look back at this congregation with such fondness. I've never in my life entered a congregation that I immediately loved so quickly as this congregation. When I came... The church was meeting in a very small portion of what is today uh, this church plant. It had started in the classrooms of uh, Oklahoma Christian. It's a beautiful little building, it's still preserved in another part of the structure. Beautiful place. But what was really beautiful were the people who were here. And that has always been the most beautiful thing about this church. The people who are here. The people who met in that little building had a great vision for the Lord. They had great leadership. And that leadership was backed by members who were dedicated and talented and generous. Through the years, the dreams of this church have become larger and larger. You have dreamed about establishing new churches in the Oklahoma City area, and you've done it. You've dreamed about having an international ministry, and you have it. You have dreamed about domestic missions, and you've followed through on those dreams. You've dreamed about a strong foreign missions program, and it has happened. 
I want to tell you again what I've said before. It is unimaginable to me, and I told this the other night at the table with Ted and Bev, it is unimaginable to me that this congregation, this one congregation, could be so blessed as to oversee the work of Mel LaTorre and Alan Dutton in South America and to be such a valuable helper of Baxter Institute in Central America. Those are the three points that I know the most about. I know the Duttons. I know Mel LaTorre. I'll be with Mel later this week, Lord willing, in South America. I know those people. You can't find better missionaries than those people. I know Baxter Institute. Baxter Institute is the finest training program I know of for churches of Christ outside the United States. It's the best I know of. And you have all these people that the Lord has sent to you that you have blessed and you have helped. How does that happen to one congregation? Well, I believe it's because you've always wanted to do more. And you have been willing to run risks. And when opportunities have arisen, you have jumped to take advantage of those opportunities. And that's what you're being asked to do with the Imagine campaign. God is giving you another opportunity to do more and more for Him. And we don't know where that will end. I don't know what the person in this pulpit 47 years from today will say about you, but I believe that if you continue to be the kind of church you have been since this church started, that he'll have better stories to tell and bigger stories to tell than I could possibly tell today. Remember this. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Our task as a church is to live for the glory of God. That's what you're doing. That's what you have done. I believe that's what you're going to do in the future. May God help you to be a church that is never, ever satisfied with just being good but wants to be the very best you can be for Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you are looking for a church home, you could not find a better one than this one right here. If you're here this morning and you've, you're out of duty, you need to get right with the Lord here at the beginning of this new year. And there's not a better place to find people to encourage you than right here. If you've never given your life to the Lord, do it today. Repent of your sins and be baptized in order to be saved and in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.